Well, rapid response reaches out to a community that's been hit hard, whether it was a hurricane, a tornado, severe wind storm, a flood such as this. We call out for the reinforcements and they come out both locally and across the country to help uh, people in need. Two days after the flood, we got a phone call saying that there was a mission organization, Eight Days of Hope, coming from Mississippi and across the United States. We couldn't do this without somebody else coming in and helping us. She had six inches of water in the house and we're pulling out all of her salvageable stuff and putting the rest of it in the dumpster. We came to this house and you know it kind of got a little mud. You know they got water up underneath in the basement. We're trying to get the mud out from where the concrete is and where the uh, water had gotten up into the insulation. We're trying to get it out to prevent the mold from growing. Just finishing up some sheetrock. Uh, we got a, a, another cabinet and sink in the back of the house that we're taking the cabinets out and sink and the uh, rest of the drywall. We're here for one purpose, and that is to share the love of Jesus Christ, and that's it. That's why we're here. Our prayer is that this community doesn't see yellow shirts, they don't see eight days of hope, but they see him. I go to Stillwater Church, uh, our, our church is part of this, and uh, thankful you guys are all here, and uh, thank you that I, that I can be a part of it. Every so often, we get an opportunity to talk to some missionaries who are out in the field serving regularly. If missions and missionaries kind of is a, maybe a foreign or an undefined concept to you, Matthew chapter 28 gives us an idea of what missions is. It's going into all the world and making disciples for Jesus. And sometimes the best way to do that is to meet some very practical needs, to show them an example of somebody who loves them with the love of Christ, to give them an example of what Jesus might look like if he had skin on and lived here in Northeast PA in 2021. And so this morning, we're going to be joined by two faces, uh, two people that may not be familiar to you at all. If you are from Benton, you've probably heard uh, Fred's name. If you live here in Salem Township for a number of years, you would have seen uh, Fred driving around in one of the police cruisers. He's formerly the police chief in Benton. He's a Salem Township police officer that's now retired. He and his wife, Sandy, serve with Eight Days of Hope. So let's welcome them this morning if we can. I think we have them. Hi, Fred and Sandy. How are we doing? We live here in Salem Township for a number of years. You, are... you guys able to hear us okay? He and his wife, Sandy, serve with Eight Days of Hope. Oh, we so let's welcome there. them this morning if we can. I think we have yeah, we got a little delay. That's okay. That's okay. So, Hi, Fred. Fred and Sandy. Hello. Hey. <laughs> How are you guys How doing are you today? This morning? Well, we're doing well. How are you? We're doing wonderful. Good. So can you tell us just a little bit about Eight Days of Hope and how you got connected? We just showed the video from Eight Days of Hope's time in Benton, which kind of sets the stage for you a little bit. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got connected with them? So we're from Benton. We owned a building on Main Street in Benton in August 2018. I was the part-time police chief in Benton at the time, and I heard this group was coming to town who uh, from Mississippi, and they were coming to help. And, I, as a police officer, I was kind of leery on who they might have been. So we paid some attention to them, and we fell in love with the organization. So what does Eight Days of Hope do when you and Sandy, you're out on the road right now, what does Eight Days of Hope do? 
So there's several arms of the ministry. Uh, the video that you just watched, that's the rapid response arm. And that's what we're doing right now. They, uh, they go out and shortly after a disaster, uh, we just left Waverly, Tennessee, where I'm sure everybody saw on the news they had a major flood in town, uh, probably a town just a little bit bigger than Nescafac. They lost 20 lives in that town. Uh, <clears throat> they had 288 homes destroyed. 168 had major damage. 31 had minor damage. And 20 were affected. 32% uh, of the homes in that town were destroyed. So we spent two weeks there uh, cleaning outhouses that could be repaired, running dehumidifiers, spraying mold remediation, and, uh, and removing everything that was wet. Hmm. There so was just piles and piles of debris out on the streets that was hauled out. Uh, there was multiple organizations there, but eight days of hope, uh, I believe they served 70 families in that two week time period. Uh, prior to that, we were in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We were cutting up trees from the Duratio last year. And tomorrow we'll be in Mandeville, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi. Louisiana. Louisiana, sorry, Louisiana, uh, after Hurricane Ida. And we'll be down there at least until October 25th, September. September 25th. I'm sorry. That's one arm of the ministry. Another arm is they go out and they rebuild, uh, homes maybe a year later. And they also do a revitalization project and right now they're only doing it in Buffalo, New York, but there's talk of possibly doing it in other cities where they'll go in and take a district and fix up a hundred or 200 homes. Uh, and they also have another arm of the ministry that was started in 2019, which is building safe houses for sex trafficking victims. So let's let's let me ask you this. You guys are part of the rapid response team. Um, what is the benefit that you see? I mean, there's some practical benefits for sure. If somebody is in, a, in the midst of a disaster or a tragedy and they've lost everything, there's some absolutely some practical benefits to a group like Eight Days of Hope coming in and serving. But what are the spiritual benefits? How do you see this helping ex extend the, the kingdom of God when you guys are on the ground in these situations? We do, whether we fix up a house or not, our main purpose there is to uplift and share the love of Jesus uh, with these people that have been affected. And I know with us, that extra, when they came to Benton and helped us, and that's what we loved about it was it was the there was just that sharing of of jesus and uh giving him all the glory and just unless you've been involved in a situation like that it's really hard to put it into words um um, one of the things they pray with everybody, each homeowner that they come across, whether they're helping them or not, if they see somebody that's struggling, they'll stop in the middle of the street and pray with whoever needs prayed with. Um, I was doing laundry this time for um, the, the volunteers, and we had to go into a laundromat, and the lady came in that was, you could just see she was so upset. And so I stopped. I talked to her while she was loading her clothes and uh, she was just, she had been 
her home had been destroyed by the flooding and she just needed somebody to talk to. And so I was there at the right time that I was able to talk to her. And then before she left, um, another lady and I prayed for. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think is the most important is that we're there to listen and to pray with them. So why is this, and I know the answer to this question because we've talked about it, but why is this so deeply personal to you guys? Can you give us some insight? In, in 2018, when Benton flooded, as I said, I was the part-time police chief. We had a brand new building that we had just purchased a year before. Um, I'm also involved with the fire company there. The day of the flood, we did 50 water rescues. Uh, my police station was underwater the fire station was underwater our business was surrounded by water and i was completely and totally um drained and not able to i needed strength and support to get me through it and when they showed up that's what they gave most to us. And it was so nice having somebody say, you don't need to worry anymore. We will help you. We'll take care of everything. And they did. And, and we felt such a calling from God after, um, it was a couple weeks later, we started talking about going on our first trip and we just felt God calling us that this was something we needed to do. I can remember if more than one occasion, Fred, you and I having conversations in the parking lot when you were on patrol during the quarantine and stuff, you know, just you talking about the passion that you had for Eight Days of Hope and to be out on the mission field when you retired. What kind of a financial burden does that place on you two? You know, missionaries often have a financial burden attached to their ability to do ministry. What does that look like for you guys as you're on the rapid response team with Eight Days of Hope? Well, we travel our financial income from our pensions that we had is very minor. Uh, and we're relying on God to provide for us. But an example, we left home on august 11th to go to cedar rapids iowa and we've been on the road ever since mm -hmm. and uh right now we're how much fuel have we spent fifteen hundred dollars since then in fuel and because we live in our camper so we don't have a home anymore we travel with a uh a big truck and a, a good sized camper and that's where we live, and we've just been on the road a lot. So your expenses then uh, are your transportation expenses our, through eight, you know, and then other things are helped uh, su supplemented through Eight Days of Hope, yes? Um, eight Days of Hope does not uh, supplement our income at all, or very little. Um, they do a couple fundraisers a year that um, we may get some money from that at the end of the year, but everybody that volunteers with Eight Days of Hope, all their expenses are their own. They do feed us and um, house us if we don't have our own camper when we're on a trip. Yeah. Well, we want to we wanna take a moment this morning. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. We want to take a moment to uh, to pray over you and to pray with you today. And as we do that, I want to just let the church know that uh, if you would feel inclined, if you feel led to contribute to support Fred and Sandy and what they're doing with Eight Days of Hope, uh, you can make a contribution to the church. Just please, if it's a check, put Eight Days of Hope or Westover in the memo. Uh, if it's cash, just please put it in an envelope with Westover or Eight Days of Hope on it, and we'll make sure that that money gets to the correct place. 
uh, in a timely fashion to help support their ministry. Uh, would you just stretch out a hand towards, uh, I know the camera's back there, but towards the screen and this morning and just, uh, just pray with me for the, for the encouragement, for the support, for the equipping of the Westovers. God, uh, you have called Fred and Sandy to something that is so unique uh, and it requires such a special uh, special anointing, a special gifting, uh, a special heart. Lord, the willingness to live on the road and to not know where one day is going to take them from here to the next day, to not necessarily even know where the income is coming from and to have the expenses that they have when they're out, they're traveling and they're serving. And so I pray uh, the favor of the Lord upon Fred and Sandy's lives not just right now in this moment, but as they continue to serve you. I pray favor financially. I pray favor physically as it takes a toll on their bodies. I pray favor emotionally as the people that they come into contact with uh, that are going through such difficult circumstances. God, I pray favor emotionally on Fred and Sandy that they would be able to be strong in the Lord uh, and supportive and encouraging to these folks with whom they interact. I, I pray also, God, that you would meet their every need. Uh, I speak over them the words of Philippians that says, my God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And we speak that over them this morning for now and forever. And we also pray safety for them. God, as they're on the road, as they're traveling, and as they're in and out of uh, what may amount to be some dangerous situations in terms of the, the flood damage or the disaster damage or in the areas that they're working in. So we pray physical safety, not just in their travel on the roads and the highways, but as they're walking around, as they're moving around in these uh, disaster areas that they serve, I pray that uh, you would bring them physical safety. Put your hedge of protection around them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray and believe continued great things to happen through Fred and Sandy through Eight Days of Hope, and we thank you for their service. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate and you. Thank and you. We will be sending you a gift in the mail, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, when you're back in town, give us a holler. We'd love to have you stop by on a Sunday morning if you're in town. We'd love to do that. So, be safe, be blessed. We love you guys.